It's Tuesday, the 24th of September. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. We got a busy week of aviation reporting ahead. I'm going to break this up into a couple of different videos. Later on this week, we're going to talk about the preliminary Indonesian report on the 737 MAX, where they blame Boeing completely. Then we'll talk about William Langawisha's report on the, in the New York Times Review magazine, what really brought down the 737 MAX, where he throws the pilots under the bus. And then we'll talk about the uh, FAA update where they're saying they're going to take all the time they need to get the 737 back in the air. But right now today we want to talk about the Delta Airlines emergency descent from last week that was portrayed in the mainstream media as an out of control plunge from 39,000 feet. Here in YouTube world, if you name your video after some kind of a specious headline, you can get in trouble for that. It's known as clickbait. The mainstream media, however, gets away with it every day in their terrifying plunge headline of an emergency descent of Delta Airlines flight 2353 on the 18th of September on a flight from Atlanta to Fort Lauderdale where they diverted to Tampa, Florida. This was a Boeing 767-300 aircraft. We don't know what the cause of the problem was that initiated the emergency descent. And there's some conflicting reports whether did the pilots deploy the pilots, the uh, passengers' oxygen masks, or did the cabin altitude exceed the preset level of 14,000 feet upon which the passenger emergency oxygen masks will automatically deploy. So let's break this down with a little bit of a systems review on this Boeing 767 and then we'll talk about it from a pilot's perspective, what's going on up in the front of the cockpit in one of these situations, and then we'll review your procedures as a passenger in one of these situations. The so-called terrifying plunge from 39,000 feet was actually 30,000 feet, 30,000 foot loss of altitude in about eight minutes, which is about 3,700 feet per minute, which is just about perfect for an emergency descent. The Boeing 767, like most airliners, have, has two air conditioning packs, which uses bleed air from the engines and ram air from the outside of the aircraft through the air cycle machines to pressurize the aircraft. It simply provides more pressure into the fuselage, or the balloon, so to speak, than it needs. And the outflow of this pressurized air is controlled by an outflow valve towards the back of the aircraft, and it's controlled by a computerized pressurization system. Fresh ram air is brought in through the NACA ducts located underneath the aircraft into the packs or pressurization and air conditioning units, two of them, located in the fuselage of the aircraft and mixed with bleed air to provide the pressurized air. The bleed air comes off the high pressure section of the compressor on the engines. The pressurization schedule is all controlled automatically by two redundant computer control systems with a manual backup. The cabin pressure is controlled with the opening and closing of the outflow valve located here towards the back of the aircraft. All this is programmed to give you a nice cabin rate of climb, that's what your ears feel, from your takeoff airport elevation up to a maximum cabin altitude of about 8,000 feet, which will maintain a minimum of 8 PSI differential pressure between the inside and outside air pressure of the cabin. These changes in cabin altitude should be no greater than four or five hundred feet per minute, just enough to set off the poor little baby's ears sitting next to you whose little eustachian tubes are very sensitive to these sort of changes. Give them something to suck on or chew on to keep those eustachian tubes clear. Included in this system are a couple of backup systems such as the negative relief valves and the press over pressurization valves. Let's take a closer look at that. These are the over pressurization valves located on the outside of the aircraft, just a simple spring loaded mechanical valve that opens up when the pressure differential exceeds a preset limit, usually around 9 psi differential. 
Here's the so-called negative pressure relief valves that open in the rare instance where the outside air pressure should exceed that of the air pressure inside the cabin. At 39,000 feet, if you were exposed to the uh, atmosphere of 39,000 feet, you would have a time of useful consciousness as a human of about 30 seconds. If you were exposed to a rapid or sudden depressurization, it might take you 10 or 15 seconds to realize what has happened and correctly react. In the Air Force, we got training in something that's called a hyperbaric chamber. They put us in a, in a uh, pressure vessel and gave us depressurization training so that we could experience our own personal hypoxia symptoms. Hypoxia is what you experience when you lose oxygen, when you're exposed to high altitudes. Everybody's hypoxia symptoms are different and that's why this Air Force training was so invaluable. It gave each of us individually an opportunity to experience our hypoxia symptoms. The primary hypoxia symptoms are one of euphoria. When you start losing that oxygen to your brain, things start going just fantastic and before you know it you don't even realize the trouble you're in and you won't even have the presence of mind to save yourself so the moment you've got any kind of pressurization problem you need to get on that oxygen and get on it right away before you even have enough wherewithal to put on your own oxygen mask and save yourself other symptoms of hypoxia include a graying of the vision, a tunneling of the vision, a bluing of the fingernails, a bluing of the lips, difficulty in, in achieving simple, simple uh, tasks, mathematical tasks. These side effects are rather insidious. One of the most dangerous types of uh, depressurization is a slow depressurization. In an explosive depressurization, you kind of get the idea right away what's going on. One of the worst kind is a slow depressurization such that these insidious side effects have a long time to build up and you may not react properly in time. We had a lot of fun in the hyperbaric chamber as young lieutenants and a lot of the different students reacted in a lot of different ways and often in rather hilarious ways. Here's what the outside of the chamber looks like. Of course, this is military training. You can't afford to get this in civilian world. Inside the chamber, you've got your oxygen regulator panel to work with. There's some color wheels up on the wall to help you identify your hypoxia symptoms. Those colors will quickly turn to gray and white and some balloons on the ceiling to let you know how much air is let out of the chamber. All great training. Fortunately, in the cockpit of a modern airliner, you're gonna get plenty of warning that you're having a problem with the pressurization and the pilots are well trained on exactly what to do. One of the first steps the pilots are gonna do is take care of themselves first. Don their oxygen masks, get their oxygen mask on, 100% oxygen, and establish communications. Again, 100% oxygen in this case is not harmful to you. As this is an emergency. Establishing communications is a bit of a cluster as you've got this big heavy mask on and the goggles on impairing your vision and you've got to press some buttons on the radio panel to make sure that you're communicating correctly between each other and to the radios outside the aircraft and to the flight attendants and or the PA, the passengers in the back. Remember too, the pilots have a separate oxygen system coming from a pair of oxygen tanks located up in the nose of the aircraft. The pilot's oxygen system is pre-flighted on every origination pre-flight. Once the pilots have donned their oxygen mask and have established communications, it's time for them to begin their emergency descent procedures and things get very busy. This is why you may not hear much from the pilots as a passenger in the back of the aircraft. Aviate, navigate, communicate. Communicate, again, is the last item on the list and they are very busy aviating and navigating and any communication the pilots are dealing with right now is dealing with communication regarding the emergency descent, working with ATC, getting other aircraft out of their way as they start their unplanned descent from their flight level. Part of the neat thing about emergency descent pilot training is that nowadays we're doing these emergency descents with the autopilot on. Typically, you'll set 
the altitude right down to 10,000 feet. Just roll it right down to 10,000 feet. That's your good habitable altitude. Assuming, of course, like in this case, you're over the water or you're over low elevation where terrain is not a factor. Hit the flight level change button, bring those throttles right back to idle, pull out the boards and start that emergency descent with the autopilot on down to 10,000 feet. Meanwhile, roll the airspeed right up to VMO or max operating speed if you want to get down in a real hurry and the nose uh, the aircraft the autopilot will pitch down to catch that speed and that'll give you three to four thousand foot per minute rate of descent plenty of time to get down to a habitable altitude of 10,000 feet the whole idea of setting the autopilot to 10,000 feet is if there's any problem with the pilots at all the aircraft will automatically level off at 10,000 feet a habitable altitude. Now if you're flying over an area of high terrain, you're going to have to change your plan. You're going to have to level off at an altitude above the terrain and then fly away from that high terrain until you can continue your descent to a habitable altitude. This is why the FAA has minimum oxygen time limit requirements. And every route for every airliner is engineered to meet these requirements. Now what's going on in the back of the aircraft with the passengers? Either the pilots have manually deployed the passenger oxygen masks, or as we affectionately call it, the rubber jungle, or the cabin altitude has exceeded 14,000 feet, upon which case the masks will automatically deploy. Now if you paid attention to your flight attendant briefing, you'll know to activate the oxygen, you need to tug on the Dixie cup. You need to tug on the line. What does that do? That pulls a lanyard that fires a firing pin that starts the exothermic reaction in the oxygen canister that will start the flow of oxygen and it'll give the passengers oxygen for about 15 to 20 minutes, 12 to 20 minutes of oxygen. This exothermic reaction going off in the cabin will produce quite a bit of heat and smoke. It can be rather alarming. Once the passenger emergency oxygen is fired up, it's gonna start a steady stream of oxygen through the little tube into the yellow cup, which you've placed hopefully over your nose and mouth and strapped onto the back of your head, and just start breathing normally. Don't hyperventilate. Don't worry about the bag. The bag may not inflate. Remember, this is a continuous flow of oxygen, and during that period where you're exhaling, that's when that oxygen is gonna continue flowing and will potentially fill up that bag a little bit. But if the bag doesn't fill up, don't worry. You are getting the oxygen that you need for this emergency descent. Remember too, as we learned in the Hawaiian Air smoke and fume incident, the yellow cup over your mouth and nose is blending in cabin air. So you're gonna smell some of that acrid smell from the emergency oxygen exothermic reaction that's going on. By the way, that chemical reaction is mostly, the core of it is sodium chlorate. I think I said clo sodium chloride before. It's sodium chlorate, less than 5% of barium peroxide and less than 1% of potassium perchlorate. Those canisters will get hot up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the aircraft gets down to 10,000 feet, the aircrew is still very busy now with diverting the aircraft into a completely new airport, so they're doing a lot of communications, sorting all that out. But at that point, once you get down to 10,000 feet, you can take that oxygen mask off. There'll be plenty of ram air circulating through the cabin, be getting plenty of fresh air in the cabin of the aircraft. So no need to panic, no need to call it an out of control plunge from 39,000 feet. It's an emergency descent. The pilots are highly trained in this procedure and they sounds like they executed the procedure flawlessly. It'll be interesting to see what caused this particular problem on the Delta flight. If we find out more information about that, we'll let you know here. So pay attention to your flight attendant briefing when you get on board the aircraft. Look at the yellow card, keep your feet off the furniture. <laughs> wear appropriate foot gear, and know where your emergency exits are. More on the 737 MAX after this. See you here.